So I'm uh, Michael Zargum. I've been studying multi-agent coordination since like 2003. Like I, I did some work on sort of social and economic games, networks, robotic swarms, all sorts of fun stuff. And like maybe 2015, I was like, I finished my PhD, which was on dynamic multi like agent resource allocation problems, networks, super fun stuff. And I was like, okay, uh, what the heck am I gonna do? And I went into like a business job and was like automating business systems. And then I learned about blockchains and I was like, wait, wait, the shit that I did is useful. Like, holy crap. And so then I sort of fell down the rabbit hole and now I'm working on all sorts of things. But um, today we're gonna talk about DAOs. And in fact, I'm gonna talk about DAOs in a very like bio-inspired way because all of my work on multi-agent coordination started with sort of bio-inspired sort of designs for systems with sort of autonomous agents. So I think about things very ecologically and you'll probably be able to see that in this. So uh, without further ado, I will mess up. Um, let's try this again. Cool, all right, so I often talk a lot about complex systems. We are talking about actually technologically enabled social systems. In fact, I do a lot of work with systems theory. I'm, I guess, technically a mathematician. It's a little bit of a stretch, but um, I do a lot of my work using sort of formal methods and work my way up to designs, implementations with other teams, and I find this very helpful. We have sort of systems, which is this wonderfully abstract conceptual thing that helps us understand how the world works, helps us build analogies between systems of, say, biological systems or ecological ones and social and financial ones or technological ones, and we are inherently dealing with complex systems, which means that the whole is sort of greater than the sum of its parts. We can't merely understand the parts and expect to understand the behavior of the whole, and of course, social systems are complex in that way. Our economic systems are social systems, and our technology-enabled ones, for example, things built on blockchains or on holochain or on any of these sort of cryptographically secured systems, well, we're introducing these technological infrastructures, but they're still fundamentally social and economic systems. And so we are going to make sure that we think about them that way and understand that they are networked, they are adaptive, they have these wonderful and terrible properties that make them hard to design, hard to steer. Um, I've been working with a lot of people to try to tease out what the heck we're doing, and that starts with sort of understanding that we're working on economic systems, and we have this concept of economic systems engineering, which is basically we actually try to design them to have certain properties. Um, we sort of step into that by talking about token engineering. There's a token engineering event on Friday that I hope many of you will attend. But the main difference between sort of economic systems engineering and token engineering is that you can't really engineer most of an economic system. It's the tokenized parts or the sort of parts that are controlled by a sort of technology that allows sort of durable data and secure computation that you can actually engineer on. You can make it work a certain way. And if you're using that to just make something that's sort of simple or flat, it's a representation of a static right or sort of a token that's just you know, a piece of, I don't know, representation of money. You're gonna spend it, its main purpose is to spend it. We might put that in this category of asset tokens. It might also just be a right to do something in the future, but it doesn't necessarily have an embedded feedback loop that does anything to the overall system to guide or steer it. When we have these sort of purpose-driven tokens, most of the things that we design to actually influence the whole trajectory of the system has this big feedback loop, and this is where we start to get into having to think about automation. Even in these social systems, we have a whole domain that I, I talked a little bit about at Web3 called cybernetics, where we start to think about steering social systems, governance systems. It's pretty tricky. Um, a lot of times things happen that you don't expect to happen. Your sort of natural inclination about doing X will produce Y can often be completely wrong. So here we wanna start to think about what these social and economic systems called DAOs are like. And I, I kind of like highlighting the fact that DAOs are just like community scale cyborgs. So we're mixing together technological signal processing blocks and sort of human signal processing blocks. We're sense making our humans are sources of data. They're in fact very important because in this frame, they're kind of like Turing oracles, right? They compute uncomputable things. There's no way for a piece of machine intelligence to compute for you what you want or what you need. So when you wire it all together, they're actually the data sources. And the computational elements inevitably act in response to, they might fuse the signals, they might help us make sense, but they don't actually provide the data that we need to make sense of. 
and we hit on that earlier, but important thing here is that we have this spatially distributed in us, time varying noisy signals, like our preferences and needs change in time, and that information has to be fused into some sort of discrete outcomes, like does our DAO wanna do this thing? Do we wanna fund this thing? Proposal, whatever. But the point is that outcome is sourced from this noisy, messy, spread out thing. There isn't like a right answer per se. There's only an answer that's inferred from this sort of you know, cyborg community thing. It's a little silly, but I think it's important to recognize the way in which our system is actually the closure between us and the tools that we use. So I like to kind of jump back at this. It's in a kind of quote pointing out that uh, well, we're actually not very diverse as a community, it's improving, but this is true of the AI community, it's, it's true of the sort of crypto community. I think it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction, but uh, in order to really do a good job, we need to continue to bring in more ideas, more people, and build things that are not just right, you know, in a sort of local sense, but are capable of being good for more people. And in fact, as I go on, I'm gonna talk about the fact that even DAOs can be diverse, and that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, I'll stop and pause and to talk a little bit about the human part of the DAO, though I don't think that it's as necessary since the previous talks really did highlight the fact that the base level identity in these systems is people, and that it's a network of people interacting with each other through some rules that are exposed by some software, or generally we can do what we want, but governing bodies or jurisdictions can sort of enforce the way that we interact with each other. But ultimately, the set of all feasible agreements between two people is just, I have some stuff that I want or need, you have some stuff that you want or need. Anything in the overlap is a feasible agreement, and we wanna find things that are sort of coordinated outcomes that we, we both want, and we want this to be decentralized. We don't need someone to tell us necessarily that like we can transact in a certain way. We need some way to realize these peer-to-peer -peer interactions at a social level sort of without you know, necessarily having strong rules that say everyone transacts in this way. So we're moving that direction with our peer-to-peer -peer systems so we can sort of realize this, I'm gonna call it network of networks. I like to use myself as an example. I am in many identities, I have many goals in very different domains. And so as an individual, I wanna be impactful in science and engineering research. My family, in a sort of local community there, I'm worried about emotional connection, I'm concerned about physical health of myself and those people. I, I run a firm, I'm concerned about its like, environment for the members of that firm, I'm concerned about making enough money to pay them, et cetera. Um, you know, I can participate in various networks for the purpose of just contributing or for profit. Um, I have sort of a basic economic need to trend, basically transact, to spend money I've made for things I need to live, my rent, et cetera. Um, you kind of get the idea. I'm a member of multiple professional communities, but it rolls up, right? I'm a member of a government or a society. I live in a country. I didn't really get to choose that, but I'm subject to that jurisdiction. And obviously, we're all sort of stuck on this planet, and if it goes up in flames, we're screwed. So we should all probably care about that one, too. But ultimately, this is, I'm in a bunch of, like, different networks with different community members. I have parts of shared identity with those people and maybe not with others in other domains. And like, okay, crap, this is really messy. Like, how do we deal with this? Well, we can't just have like one shape of organization. We can't just have like, here's the blueprint of a DAO. The idea is that we're gonna have many kinds of communities at different scales and that we're gonna need the infrastructure for those communities to be built up over time. And so, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about what is the composition of a DAO, at least in my opinion. So, and actually, I'll argue, this is the composition of any autonomous human system. A firm would follow this model too. It's just that this edge up at the top, this participation one's pretty weak, if present at all. So we have a couple things going on here. One is, we've got a community interacting with a set of rules about how they're allowed to interact with each other. So you can do stuff, some of the stuff you can do actually happens. When we have technologically empowered systems like smart contracts, maybe what I can do is a function of the current state of the system. So, hey, this is the state. Here's some information that is essentially automated in the sort of control theory sense. I'm saying, cool, the state of the system is, I have 10 Bitcoin, I can send up to 10 Bitcoin if I try to send more than that. Sorry, you can't, that's not in my can-do set because of the state feedback here. So we actually have these dynamic systems in an automation sense that can become much more complex over here, but this is like algorithmic, state-based 
access control, rights management, state-dependent outcomes, something like Uniswap says, when I transact and I move the price, then I'm actually gonna realize the price that I acted upon. Bonding curves have this property too. That's all the yellow box. And it just describes what we can do. It's interesting to see what we actually do. But then this outermost loop is really important because until you add that loop, this isn't really an autonomous system because it's not self-steering. It may be automated, but it becomes autonomous the moment that it's sort of closed loop on itself, defines its own adaptation, its own goals. Like if this system had a set of goals that were encoded in this yellow box and it was steering, then through this green box, we could even change those goals. Those goals could become out of alignment with our human level value system, and we can only fix it and steer ourselves if we have the green box in place. And we're not very good at the green box yet, so we got a lot of work to do, but we really have decentralized autonomous organizations when we close that green box loop effectively, and in particular, we gotta remember that this is pretty true even of, um, of centralized organizations just without this, this line, that someone from outside is just saying, hey, here's your goals, here's what you do. Our move here is to get rid of this outside, like, you know, or, you know, actor controlling this loop and make it a link here. And for that, we actually need to be informed. It's not really good enough to close the loop. We are, if we're steering, we gotta make sure that we're sort of steering effectively. And so that'll be probably a whole nother talk. I don't really have time to do it today, but <laughs> so I have to hit on uh, some other stuff. But I, I'm really excited about improving this. There's an article on Medium called Computer-Aided Governance, which builds off of computer-aided design. But for now, I'm gonna sort of go into um, a few slides from Common Stack, which is a project where I am, well, the sort of designer. We're gonna talk a little bit about the designs, but ultimately the motivation is we've got these problems that I think everyone in the room is aware of. They're fundamental coordination problems. Um, Common Stack is particularly focused in DAOs around um, creating and maintaining public goods, which are a little tricky because it's a lot harder to make money when your output is supposed to be goods for everyone to use. Um, but we still think that using small community models since they've sort of been represented in the past, um, it's possible and that we can enable this through DAOs. And so our branch of the sort of DAO world is gonna be to try to make commons or public good DAOs that are sufficiently incentivized to maintain those goods, but with the understanding that they may be very small communities and there may need to be many of them. And we think about this as actually a good starting point for how to see DAOs in a broader sense as little building blocks of a future society itself, right? Not all of them have to be the same kind. And in fact, we can imagine them factoring apart based on their own value systems, based on what they're producing, what they, what they want to get, what they provide, et cetera. And this sort of network of networks that's you know, individual community centric is actually pretty natural ontology. It kind of appears in the way the world works and we think that it's more basic. And so our work is sort of this roadmap. It's maybe a little bit stylized, but we're working on our version of the bonding curve, which is something that uh, I designed. I'm probably not gonna go into it, but it's very closely related to some of the other bonding curve work with the exception that um, I started from not the price, but from a it's like an invariant function that characterizes the relationship between the supply and the reserve, and it has some nice mathematical proofs that come from that. It's actually the same construct for the most part, but it makes it a little easier to plug it in as an interface between two systems because it's um, sort of designed from a, a different set of first principles, even if it has similar properties. And then we're integrating with the GiveEth DAP for sort of transparency and sign-offs and managing funds, and we are um, actually another piece of uh, I'm actually really excited about this conviction voting algorithm. It's not really voting so much as, as it's sensor fusion. I hijacked it for my PhD thesis and it's meant to take noisy decentralized data, pull some of that noise out of it and turn it into a co coherent signal. Um, not also not probably the right time to go into that in details, but I'm happy to chat about it more. And then actually this commons analytics dashboard is about informing the governance. So if you have a system, if it's complex, if it's not clear what the results of your change is gonna be, you really don't wanna be just trial and error at the level of governance. You wanna have a little bit of transparency at the system level. And if you make that part of the open source stack, you're not saying, here's what you should do. You're saying, here's a tool to help you decide what your opinion is 
so that the DAO can make sense of it, which is actually a different kind of thing. It's not saying, hey, let's do a smarter thing with the data that came from the people. We're actually putting a block on the other side that says, help the people make better sense of the data they're seeing so their signal is stronger, so the signal they feed back into governance is stronger. I'm pretty stoked about that. We call this our minimum viable commons. Ironically, it's not the first thing we're gonna launch. We're gonna launch, um, or at least help launch, or enable the launching of um, multiple systems in order to field test things and sort of get it right. Um, but I'm gonna talk about what a commons is sort of supposed to do in theory. I say in theory because we gotta build one. <laughs> but um, the idea is to de decompose the uh, decision-making loop from the capital loop in a way that allows people to sort of participate in the steering or the governance of the commons or of this sort of I say commons here, not just DAO, because I'm not just referring to even the people in the software, but even the material outputs of their collective labor. And so we wanna drive this material outputs that should drive future funding, whatever that source may be. And we wanna basically ensure that people have the opportunity to participate in governance. And I draw it this way because I don't think we wanna collapse all of our public goods into like one mega commons. We actually want a decentralized network of individual communities managing individual projects, whether they're open source projects or they're maintaining a park, shouldn't really matter. And if we have a decentralized economy that they're webbed into, they could be interconnected in non-trivial ways. Maybe one of them uses the outflows of another one. Maybe some people belong to both. It's meant to sort of emerge. And this is the sort of, well, circuit diagram, so to speak, of the value flows in the common stack design. Due to our overall time, I think I'm gonna suggest that if someone wants to walk through this, I will talk with them offline. But it's actually not too crazy. The bonding curve is actually being used as sort of a cell wall or an adapter pattern between uh, the outside economy and the inside economy. So it regulates the flow. Um, it allows us to have an internal metabolism that's intended to make decisions, allocate capital, produce material outputs, and if we manage to produce enough material outputs that incentivizes the out outside world to continue to sustain this thing, it can continue to exist. If you're not good at using this machinery to produce valuable material output, maybe that DAO sort of, you know, shrivels up and dies. Obviously that's not ideal, but it's actually reasonable when we think about these things as organisms. We actually want the communities that are like able to successfully take in one kind of input and output more value than they consumed to be the things that thrive. So a little bit of a sense of how I manage this. So I built a software with my team at Block Science called CAD-CAD. It's called Complex Adaptive Dynamics Computer-Aided Design. It basically allows you to build multi-scale simulations of economies with this sort of biomimetic type of design or with any other design. I basically ran into this problem that I used to do all sorts of crazy decision systems design with MATLAB during my PhD and before. And well, we don't have any of that in open source land. And so we started building this for ourselves in the Python data science stack. And we're ramping up to try to get it out to the community as the first deliverable of the common stack. It'll be an open source tool. Um, here I'm playing around with the trigger functions. The conviction voting is actually a algorithm that sort of works like an action potential building up. So when the community gets enough built up accumulated support for a proposal, it fires and passes, which is a little different from a traditional time box voting. Doesn't have a fixed time, something could be listed and never pass technically, or it could pass very quickly up to the minimum time frame because it's literally like a neuron firing. And we can play around with the parameters to look, like, look at what that neuron firing does and how changing it affects the overall system dynamics. And so here's some like examples of plots that come out of that simulation. So, you know, candidate proposals, completed proposals, we've got some killed ones, some failed ones, some that are in process, succeeding at, you know, the work of a proposal leads to payouts. Um, the whole system has a bonding curve as an interface and we sort of make sure that we are like understand the system is staying on that curve. Um, keep track of the agents and their holdings and the proposals and their likelihood to pass and their status and sort of the pricing. It's pretty crazy. It actually took a couple months to put this together and to, to be completely honest with you, needs to have a lot more experiments run and be refined, but it was part of the early stage motivation for the common stack that we were able to get the design implemented, play around with it a little bit and say, hey, like these ideas, they're actually, you know, this could work. Let's put the time in to make it happen. 
Um, I will always point out, though, that all of these systems are, um, because they're social and economic systems, they inevitably the objectives that we design into them, they're subjective choices. So I won't belabor it here in this talk, but I always bring up the fact that every community is going to have its own purposes and value system because necessarily there isn't an objectively correct one. And so this idea of a diversity of DAOs is that you need people to be able to self-sort. You need to sort of factor things out by value system so that people can vote with their feet and participate in the DAOs that share their value system. That could mean how they're constructed. That could mean how the community in that DAO behaves. Can mean a lot of things. So for the moment, there's a lot going on. We've got some infrastructure being built. Um, I'm probably not going to belabor a lot of this stuff because you guys have seen some of these, so I'll just chat about things that I've been involved in. Um, Ferrament is uh, the company building continuous organizations. If you read an early bonding curve articles, I'm doing a little bit of work um, with my team sort of analyzing, preparing, and tuning some of those systems. They're continuous equities effectively. Um, they're a little closer to the corporate, but they're more intended to help startups actually function in the bridge world. Like, okay, I want a decentralized, continuously funded thing, but I need to deal with some legal aspects. And it's, it's challenging, but we need these bridge DAOs. Um, and I think it's very important. Um, Common Stack I've talked about. We're pretty familiar with the funding clubs like Moloch and um, Meta Cartel. I mean, MakerDAO is a DAO, although it is still heavily managed token voting with Maker, and some of the changes are feel a little centralized, but it's still a pretty major piece of infrastructure. Um, I've talked a bit about the goals with Common Stack. This is a um, this is a logo from SourceCred. I don't know if you guys heard um, about it. It's invo it involves measuring sort of contributions to systems. Um, GitHub focused, also discourse. It's a pretty critical building block for DAOs that might grow beyond the scope where you can clearly see what everyone's doing and you need a way of measuring not just people's activity but the way it interrelates. It's not um, explicitly um, a DAO yet, but it's something there. there's a proposal for and they'll f in the future be a thing called source grain, which is used to essentially interconnect different open source projects and you can read about it on the discourse. Um, I'm planning on doing integration tests with SourceCred for some of the DAO designs I've worked on. I believe uh, Ryan Zer's work includes uh, potential integration with SourceCred as well. Um, it's definitely something to look out for. Um, and again, it's about closing this feedback loop, right? We need to be informed in order to participate in governance. Um, another point, and the last couple points I'm going to make are about like what it's like to think ecologically here. So this whole Yang Dao thing led to some like interesting splits. Some people were really excited. Some people were pretty pissed. I don't think we had any explicit rage quits, but we definitely had some discussions about people rage quitting as a result of the support of Yang Dao. And I think it's important to recognize that communities, even inside of the community, aren't necessarily going to agree on everything. And so what does that really mean? Well, you can stay or you can go. But if you go, you realize that there might be some interesting things emerging here. So I use this cell, uh, cell splitting analogy to explain why this is a good thing. Because we might have a community, and it might have a core. That red circle is the sort of people who are maintaining it. And maybe the blue circle is the like heavy contributors or just like a slightly wider ring. And then we have the whole community. Maybe it's everyone who holds any funds or is paying attention to this thing. And if there's enough of a split in what people think should happen, if the value system factors out and there's a bifurcation, instead of deadlock, we can have this sort of forking process where the community starts to split. Eventually, you have two code bases. You have two groups of maintainers. You have an evolution to two, two separate entities. And maybe they're the same size. Maybe one's small and one's big. Who knows what can happen from here? But we can actually view this as a form of, like, of reproduction, that it's close, but far enough that maybe it needs its own infrastructure, maybe it needs to grow into its own community, and then it kind of lives or dies on its own right. But this kind of thing is not bad. We should not get upset with each other. We should view this as a, a path to a more sustainable ecology of DAOs. And so in addition to splitting, we can think about how governance think, 
fits into our bio analogies. And in particular, it's sort of like, uh, I mean, it's a little less bio, but it's an adaptive maintenance or it's a health or a regulatory system. We are participating in the adaptation process of this you know, organization. And if we do a good job and the thing stays healthy, it stays in alignment with our needs and our norms, it's literally co-evolving with us. So it's not just like a magic piece of technology that we fly around, like a spaceship. It's actually us and that thing. And if it gets out of alignment with us, we're gonna have problems. So remembering that like we are part of the system is a really important part of building and maintaining DAOs, and even in initializing DAOs. Like if you're gonna launch something, it has to be with a group of people for which it is value system aligned, otherwise it's also probably just gonna fall apart. So uh, my last slide is about what ecological economics actually could look like in a world of DAOs. And so remember that in ecologies, there's not one kind of value, there's all sorts of different kind of value. And the part of what makes this a positive sum game is the fact that what I want and need isn't what you want and need. And maybe what my DAO wants and needs and what your DAO wants and needs aren't the same thing. So in effect, diversity is actually one of the most important traits in ecological systems. We want to be different. If we're different, we can actually create positive sum games. And so I'm excited about all the tools that everyone here is building. I'm working to build some of my own, trying to make those things complementary. And even in the creation of these organizations themselves, we need to be careful about making lots of copies of the same thing because that's less diverse, that's less sustainable. What we really need are systems of systems containing these decentralized organizations where the inflows of one or the outflows are another and we actually generate an, in a sustainable economy instead of one that is unfortunately, necessarily zero sum if we're all counting dollars. So that is what I'm advocating for, and that's why I'm excited to be here. So I hope you guys are uh, also excited. So that's it. I wrote a bunch of um, I wrote a, wrote a bunch of Python notebooks to help with the design and explain stuff to people, and it, no one wanted to touch them. And like my friend Abby wrote this article with all this math, and like you know a bunch of people read it, but no one understood it. And then we were like, screw it, we're gonna make a JavaScript app and let people play around with it. So if you're interested, you can go to Common Stack GitHub Augmented uh, Bonding. It's Augmented TBC Design, um, but it totally allows you to see the bonding curve and also to look at examples of what would happen in different situations. So probably one of the best ways to learn about the first component that we're building, but I didn't want to do a, a shill on the video, or I guess this is still on the video. But fun, play with it, learn about bonding curves. Sorry, any questions? <laughs> oh, lots of questions, okay. Um, Hello, uh, has CAD, CAD been used to, with reputation tokens, or can it, could it be used to? Yeah, so there's nothing about CAD CAD that's actually specific even to tokens. It's actually just a multi-scale modeling framework, so it allows you to represent, like, I call them sort of generalized differential equations, or we built it from data science infrastructure, meaning you get data structures, and then you define the rules over which they evolve, and they evolve mm -hmm. in a loop. And so actually even the simulation that I pulled some slides out of has um, uh, the conviction voting actually embedded in it. And in that system, the tokens being used for conviction voting are, um, they're not uh, transferable. They are only burnable and um, sort of, you can, you can deposit to mint them and you can burn to get rid of them. You can accumulate them either by putting in capital or through contributions to the system. So they are in a sense, reputation tokens, but they're far from the only way to construct a reputation token, and CAD CAD in general is actually just, it's its down to what you can represent. Yes. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, I, do you wanna? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, can you go back to the slide with the cell division? So. If we model that. Which one? The cell division, yeah. That oh, one. this one. So uh, in reality, now it would be more like a bunch of naked uh, DNA structure without any resources. So I, I thought maybe forks should be also 
um, kind of govern on chain and include some of the resources of the DAO. So if a bunch of DAO members fork away, they also get to take away some of the reserve fund. Um, I mean, it would be plausible to build a meta structure like that. I would argue that that's at the point where maybe you have a DAO, which is a federation of DAOs, and then the rules about how you become a new member if you say leave, maybe that would make sense. But I think at the base level here, we're keeping this simple where the code base might fork, and suppose for the moment the red is the code base, we go from one copy to two, some of the maintainers might continue to participate in both, and the community might participate in both, but in the long term, we would sort of expect them to grow apart. Um, this structure is much more social description, but I think in an environment where we get to federations, so DAOs which are you know, comprised of DAOs, then I think it would make sense for those meta structures to contain rules about what happened if you forked, and that if there were resources, that there would be a way of saying, well, if you want to be a, still a member of the federation post-fork, you might have to abide by certain sort of resource sharing principles. Um, I'd like to play the devil's advocate and I'd like to question the, the applicability of mathematical models. So they tend to work really well in, in, in biology and, and physics because you have these many, many entities like atoms or cells that behave unpredictably and uncalculably on their own, but as a whole um, have predictable behavior. And so what yeah. do you I So mean, I think I need you need to separate the difference between predictable behavior and predictable processing of behavior. So the physical world processes our behavior. Like if I want to run up a mountain, I have the choice to do it, but I'm going to expend a shit ton of energy and it's guaranteed that I'm going to expend at least enough energy to bring my body up the mountain. So the likelihood of us all collecting on top of a mountain is very low. And so the way that we use mathematical models here is kind of an abstraction of energy functions for the most part and signal processing and I say like I'm a mathematician I'm not going to try to go down into the weeds but I'm very much not trying to predict what people are going to do I'm trying to construct sort of energy spaces that have like well-defined properties in the sense that yeah like you can go wherever you want but it's like if you go over there it's going to cost you a lot more energy if you go over here and if you do that you can not so much predict what anyone's going to do or even try to but you're like processing the behavior, you're steering to some extent, you want to align these things with the goals of the system, but I want to be very clear, the goal here is not to like predict or force anything. You want to create high agency systems with minimal sort of reductions on the dimensionality of the action space, but still maintain some predictable properties. And the most basic case is still just Bitcoin. When you think about it, Bitcoin has a one-dimensional restrictive invariant. Literally, no double spends. It's a conservation law. Imposing it actually provides the utility of the system. If it were missing, even though it's a restriction, it wouldn't matter that you could do whatever you want because no one would trust anything and it wouldn't be good for anything. So the function and purpose of a system is actually derived from its restrictions, but we gotta be careful and keep those to a minimum and understand their impact on the behavior. Uh, and does that help? Like, it's, it's a little dicey because we're getting into sort of this abstraction realm where we're just trying to embed some really basic natural laws, but that have those natural laws be aligned with some purpose. I'll need some time to process your, your answer, but let me elaborate on my first line of thought. Um, I mean, if, if you add up all of the people in the crypto space now, they, it might not be enough people to, to, il, I mean, to apply this model to. I, and I, we might be designing for a future that we imagine that there will be, but there's no path to it. So, don't we need to think first about systems that have a lot less members? If you, if you look at the Web 2.0 system, yeah. for example, they also designed for, um, for an environment where they have many, many users and have predictable behavior. In the way to that yeah. s situation, they need like, things like growth hacking, um, like faking some... some I, I'm totally aware. Something. I just think that like we aren't making the assumptions that you're describing because we're not designing using a statistical aggregation-based methodology. We're, like In a world that has gravity, if there's only one person, you still have to respect gravity. So if I am the only person in the world, it's still going to cost me the same amount of energy to surmount Everest. Like, it doesn't matter. Now, to get don't get me wrong, in order to like make meaningful predictions about the statistical distribution of a large number of people, I might need to make assumptions like there are a large number of people, but the statement about how much energy it takes to get to the top of a mountain doesn't actually care that there's only one of me. So, 
Um, do you have time for one more? Yeah, so great talk. You're working on really great stuff. I do want to kind of uh, vibe off of the, some of the previous questions. So I, I read your CAD CAG article, and you, you kind of mentioned there's an asterisk, like we should be careful because there's a second order process here where when we model the system, we, we, then, we then change it because we're aware of the modeling. You sort of say, you know, by the way, we should pay attention. But I feel like you almost are overly optimistic even with that because, you know, it, it's not just one order out. It keeps going recursively forever. Like it turtles all the way down. You're aware of the effect and that itself changes and like it goes out forever. So do you feel like you're, you know, like in, in as much as economic models are like historically a joke for being wrong, do you not feel you're being overly optimistic by, by saying that we can like model the effects of policies so easily? I think maybe the issue here is I'm really not fitting into the paradigm of what I would call the, the data science where we model and then we do, I mean, I very much want to do things that involve predicting things, but I'm very, very cautious about the idea that we're going to predict things correctly. I'm much more interested in the cybernetic or control theoretic loops and basically steering concepts. And that means that, uh, in a sense, I agree with you completely, but I'm also trying to take a path that uses a different set of tools, maybe not the ones that are as prevalent today. And the focus here is on closing loops so that we are steering systems and observing them sort of as we go. So my ideas with CAD CAD and with the computer aided governance on top of it are less about, oh look, we predicted exactly what's gonna happen and more like, okay, so I wanna instantiate a system. Maybe I should absolutely start with a small group of people who are aligned around the incentives and the value system of that. And there's another article coming with the common stack called the trusted seed, which is about initializing small communities with shared values and trying to to sort of use that as a bootstrapping and, and grow slowly over time. So I'm totally on board with that. Um, the article's not out yet. Project's just really going public. Um, in terms of the use of CAD CAD, it's not about saying, I know exactly what's going to happen. It's actually about sweeping all sorts of possible assumptions, changing behaviors. We have A-B testing supported natively. It's about changing parameters and saying, well, if we think that it's this, but maybe it's a strong or weak effect, sweeping that parameter. Like, it's about like robust analysis where we're getting to the point where, hey, it more or less moves in the direction we want it to move under all of these possible considerations, none of which we really know is right. And that's much more the way that we do like large scale infrastructure testing. Like we're, we're taking this approach where there's a lot of shit that we don't know. We build models that explain how the mechanisms work, the mechanical parts work. Take the human parts and go, cool, well we have some behavioral economics, we have some statistical models, we have all sorts of stuff, none of which we know is right or wrong. We throw the kitchen sink at it and see if it still does more or less what we want under all reasonable conditions and even what the failure modes might be so that we can steer away from them. All of that is less prediction and way more just understand. And even still, we respect that that's bounded. And then when it comes to governance, it's more about not saying, tell me optimally what to do to make X happen. It's about saying, well, I'm flying an airplane and it's moving on more or less the right heading. I want to see if I turn like slightly right, am I going to accidentally end up, I don't know, turned left instead? Because that's the kind of thing we get with complex systems, right? I think I want to go right. I push it in the way that I think is going to make it go right, and it goes left. And what we want to be able to say is, given what we know about the internal dynamics of this system, like, you know what, if I push right, is it going to turn right? or is it gonna accidentally turn left? And even then, we're gonna do it, and it's gonna start moving, and it might do the other thing, but hopefully at least then, we now have the information integrated enough that our model can learn that, hey, given everything we've seen in the combination of the rules, or the white boxes in the sort of control sense, and the black boxes that we know are there, but we don't know how they behave, we synthesize that, and maybe next time we're like, haha, if I push it a little bit right, it's gonna go left. And, and this is an iterative process in and of itself. So I really do sort of get stuck in between these two extremes because I'm very experienced with sort of these robotic systems where we have lots of complexity, uncertainty, even adversarial behavior, and we use mathematical models and tools to do stuff. And then like the fact that we don't want to oversell what we can accomplish. And like the trick is essentially, well, I, I like to say it's goals plus epistemology plus process automation. Literally figure out what we want to do, figure out the best thing that we can know, both the limits of it and the possibilities, automate as much of that as possible, then look at how well we did against our goals and repeat, and that the only way we're gonna proceed is by actually 
doing that process, not just technically, but as humans. And so it's, it's, I walk into one room and people are like, you're too optimistic about the mathematics. And then the other end, I'm like, you know, I'm too pessimistic about things because I often criticize the stuff that we've built because I analyze it some and I'm like, ah, oh, there's some systemic risk here or there. How do we mitigate it? So I'm like, maybe I'm just trying to play both sides or more realistically, I'm just trying to find balance. Uh, beginning from this idea that as we design tools, these tools design us back, right? So as we design these systems, we're also, the mediation and interaction with these systems, they're also changing our, our social organizations. And so my question is, so you have the work of Eleanor Ostrom in the Commons and how these social protocols are mediated and they're very malleable, right? Like how they agree. And I'm wondering, as we design these tools that try to mimic these behaviors that are already present, but we, we, we're building abstractions on top of this, such as bonding curves, such as holographic consensus, all these very mechanic uh, abstractions into these systems. So I'm wondering if, as we design these systems, should we try to get close to, to these organic social protocols as possible, or if we're designing these new abstractions, uh, do we know what they might create within the systems? Because it's obvious that even though we might be inspired by how stigma, stigma, stigma tree, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, these, these very organisms and collective intelligence, how they, how they organize, but we're trying to replicate them, building these systems and these protocols. So I'm wondering if we should try to mimic them by their design and trying to be as malleable and flexible as possible, or if we're designing these new abstractions, do we know what they create? Because it will create a, t a change, right? Yeah, so this is, maybe it's going in a rabbit hole, but like when we deal with systems of systems, we have networks of abstractions, even networks of hierarchy, hierarchies of abstractions. And the hard part is knowing which abstraction to be in or even how to adapt those things. So in our complex adaptive dynamics, you have the ability to learn either parameters or even modify the very models in those abstractions. So that outer loop is the thing that's controlled by the governance loop in my early drawing that I talked about, but more importantly, Importantly, as we get down into these systems, we have to recognize that these abstractions are models, all models are wrong, they're useful to some end. You ask, like, am I even in the right model or in the right abstraction for the thing that the problem I'm trying to solve or the state my system is in. And so actually in engineering, in systems, we have to deal with questions of like nested hierarchies of abstractions, graphs of abstractions. You get into something called like a model, it's model-based systems engineering where you're dealing with systems of systems which are just represented by their own abstractions and things get messy and I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to dive into how to do this, but the truth is that your models sort of need to know their own support and when they start to get near the edges of where they work, they need to sort of know enough to delegate to another model. And um, this is something that you see in like cyber physical systems and like grid systems. You have hybrid controls that say, oh no, I'm at risk of failure. Now instead of my normal operating procedure, I'm in, oh no, don't blow up procedure. Like it's, it's messy and I think I want to see this more organic because if you have a top-down design, it's not going to be you know, it's just not gonna be decentralized, but if we have a diversity of all of these different systems, then their individual sort of, in a sense, each DAO is a model of the world, and maybe that DAO is going to be successful in so far as and where that model is appropriate, and maybe it's not so much gonna be able to grow into a space where it doesn't fit, but if we have a big, you know, diversity of these things, then maybe they start to grow and fill in the spaces we have and we get model appropriate solutions in context and they don't necessarily take over spaces that they're not the right fit for. I'm, I mean, I don't wanna screw up your schedule. I feel like I've been going way too long, so I'll sit here and answer questions as long as you guys want though. simulate and design a complex economic system, or is there some sort of work plan that gives uh, some interactivity? Yes, so I am working on a variety of diagramming syntaxes to help get from I have a vague idea about a system to now I, I've gone from something that reflects some conservation equations. So um, uh, 
I'll, I'll not, I kind of attempted to go dig through, but um, so the this sort of what Jeff calls a token circuit diagram is essentially a system dynamics diagram, but adopted to account for the agency of the actors. So system dynamics is a sort of sub-discipline that uses um, differential equations to model business systems and sometimes like environmental and other economic systems. It has a sort of stock and flow differential model, but it's very much like it's um, the the, the the concepts are like this happens automatically, and I don't think that fits our differential games. Our economic systems are much more, I do things when it's good for me, not they don't just happen automatically. So I sort of took away the part that says, okay, this just happens, and added a sort of notion of actors acting upon mechanisms, but it's largely a, an update to the system dynamic syntax, and we use it to keep track of how things flow, conditioned on certain behavior, helps us with two kinds of uh, mathematical sort of properties. One is a differential relationship, meaning when this happens, this thing flows, so how things change, and the other is the conservation of, say, an asset. So you got the reasonable invariant properties or the configuration space defining properties, the things that tell you the shape of the space. So if something can change in a certain way, then in, like in robotics there's a configuration space that says you know, all the points on this arm can move in certain ways, but there's also shit that can't happen because of the length of the arm and the limitations of the joints. And these lower dimensional spaces, they kind of give you a shape. And that shape affects what can happen. And this is the reason why these systems, despite behavior, I analogize to like mountains, is because if you design the shape of the space, some things are more likely to happen than others. There's also, I was reading a paper at some point where they talk about the invention of the corridor. Like someone invented a corridor. There were buildings, there were no corridors. There were just rooms attached to each other. And someone thought, hey, like maybe I can funnel people here by putting this hallway thing in. Like that's a physical change of the shape of space. Like imagine before there were hallways. There were just rooms attached to each other. And when you invented that physical structure, it changed the flow of people, even though it's just a physical change. And so we're really thinking about architecture and cyberspace here. We're making shape of space to help people do things. And that's why I actually believe the mathematics applies. Not because I can make someone do something, but because I believe that I can literally change the space in which they are doing. And that will have effects on the way that their behavior accumulates. Um, I don't know if that helps, but we're trying to make it possible to see that a little more visually because the challenge with CAD-CAD is you can simulate stuff, but you need something to simulate. And you get there, in our case, by usually a little bit of diagramming and playing around, then slightly more formal diagrams. And we're going to probably write a specification for what we call a differential spec, which is actually a workflow that says, here are all the decision processes. Here are all the mechanistic properties that are a consequence of those decisions. Here's the layer of states. And here's the level of metrics. And the whole thing computes like down and around. And actually, we have a couple of those for projects, um, again, really tempted to dig through my computer, but it'll kill a lot of time. Uh, we build diagrams like that, and we have syntaxes that have been hardening, and I'm hoping that once CAD-CAD is open source, other people will participate in those syntaxes and maybe even help us bring them from our own tools into something that's a bit more standard. One short question, three short, in terms of... Uh, yeah. We're over, we're yeah. over time, though. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> a lot going on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.